All right, so um, we're gonna be talking today about the Grand Valley Flu Hazard Zone Mapping Project, uh, myself and Molly Guinea. And uh, just a brief introduction to our sponsors. Um, so the Colorado Water Conservation Board funded this through their uh, watershed restoration grant program that uh, Rivers Edge West applied for. Um, so we're working for under contract with Rivers Edge West. Um, and this is part of the Grand Valley River Corridor Initiative, which um, seeks to bring folks together to um, coordinate activities and planning in the River Corridor here in the Grand Valley. You can get more information about the Fluvio Hazard Zone project and program in Colorado um, on this link. And um, if you didn't get a chance to look at some of the materials that we have posted on our website, please take a minute to do so. Um, just for some more background, but we'll do a little bit of background today as well on the program and what it is. So bottom line, kind of up front, streams are dynamic. They um, require space within their corridor as they move. And streams are corridors, not lines necessarily on a map. So they're not static. Um, there's here we're presenting today a way to define the space they occupy and influence. And uh, we can use this delineation and mapping to um, better manage our streams and better have more informed stream management uh, as we um, develop and interact with our river corridor. And you'll notice behind here, I've got just the uh, river margins maps in an area that's coming up to Redlands Parkway. And it's just showing from what uh, we'll, we'll talk about a little more specifically, but 1937 all the way up to uh, present time of where, where the river is as it's migrating down its corridor. So the Flu Hazard Zone program is something that started in Colorado after the 2013 floods, but Colorado is no stranger to dynamic rivers and um, rivers that move across their floodplain often with, um, you know, the impacts and hazards to the communities that live around them. So here's um, Cherry Creek flood in Denver. We've got the Big Thompson River on the Front Range um, that's flooded multiple times in the Drake area. And um, the St. Brain and Lyons. Um, all of these are pretty dramatic examples of rivers moving, avulsing, and um, causing devastation to the development around them, communities around them. Um, but out here, well, this is the Western Slope, but they kind of um, snow melt fed larger rivers that we have in the Rocky Mountains, um, some of which on the Western Slope have different responses. We've got bigger rivers that are fed by snow melts. The Rio Grande is an example of one that's kind of meandering across its floodplain, creating bends and abandoning those bends and finding new paths as it goes. Um, Yampa is another example of that. And the Colorado River is kind of similar um, historically where it's a river that has wandered across its floodplain, creating meanders, abandoning them, um, cutting them off, and creating side channels. This is the process that created a lot of the habitat that our endangered fish used in the past and, and still used to some extent today where it exists. So this is an image from 1937 in the Grand Valley in the Clifton area. And here's just some um, that image again, where we see the Colorado River migrating across its floodplain um, from 1937 to 86 and contemporary with that image behind it. Um, so we still have active migration. A lot of that we have attempted to um, arrest through bank revetments and armoring. Um, we also have obviously extensive gravel mining in the floodplain with associated levees that um, might try to arrest that, that migration as well. Um, so kind of the context of the river in the Grand Valley is still um, has the flow and sediment supply to create dynam dynamism and migration, but obviously we have a lot of infrastructure and public works um, that are wrestling with that. So um, let me see here. I'm gonna just talk briefly about what the fluvial hazard zone is, how we define it in Colorado. And then I'm gonna kick it over to Molly to discuss some of the components of it and, and how we map those. The fluvio hazard zone is the area stream has occupied in recent history, could occupy or physically influence as it stores and transports sediment 
water and debris. And um, these fluvial geomorphic processes, so fluvial means river, geomorphology means the shape, morph morphos of the land, geo. So how rivers shape the land essentially. And those processes, these river shaping processes could occur gradually over time, like we often see on the Colorado River or acutely during a flood event. And those also happen on the Colorado and Gunnison Rivers. Um, and so 86 is a great, or sorry, the um, early 80s is a great example of where the river moved dramatically, um, causing you know, new paths to be developed over time. Um, and then the gradual development is that kind of gradual bank erosion and then deposition behind it. So the fluvial hazard zone is defined and kind of outlined the process for mapping and is outlined in this protocol that I have the um, pleasure of being a co-author of. We published this in 2020 and uh, for the CWCD. So the protocol is available on that website. Um, it's a big document that kind of outlines the um, kind of theory and, and processes behind what fluvial geomorphic hazards are as well as the kind of methods behind it. The main components of it are the active stream corridor, which is this yellow line um, on this cartoon here. And uh, we'll get some definitions from Molly in a minute, but this is kind of like the geomorphic floodplain or the active floodplain that the channel is occupying and kind of migrates through. Um, then we have the fluvial hazard buffer, and that's a buffer that could be influenced as the um, channel migrates, as we could have hill slope failures and that sort of thing. Avulsion hazard zones, not shown here, but this is where their channel could wholesale find a new path across a valley. And then we have other kind of auxiliary flags and, and um, delineation things where we're trying to identify where we could have um, other hazards such as really big hill slope failures with geotechnical flags. And then also areas where the um, active stream corridor has been cut off by a major infrastructure project like an interstate or a FEMA certified levy. So we'll talk specifically in a, in a second here about the active stream corridor and a fluvial hazard buffer. Um, but first I'm gonna just look, look a little bit at the difference between the fluvial hazard zone or FHZ and flood, flood inundation maps and models, which we um, typically think of when we think of floodplain mapping. So here on the top, we have fluvial geomorphic hazards, sediment deposition, erosion. And on the bottom, we have inundation hazards, so where water goes after or during flood events. Um, the, let's see here, FEMA flood insurance rate maps are firms that Gary Gudorf you know, uses and, and uses to ma um, manage the floodplain in Mesa County are maps that are created through uh, hy hydrologic and hydraulic modeling process. Um, they use the existing topography at the time of map development. Um, and obviously they're really important to identify where water would go during certain um, frequency flood events. So here we see the flood way, which is a hatched line. That's the kind of core of the flood plain. We have the 1% um, annual chance flood in blue, and then the 0.2% um, or 500 year flood event in green. So these are um, static maps and, and serve really important function from a regulatory standpoint, and also kind of a planning and hazard assessment standpoint. The fluvial hazard zone uh, accounts for a dynamic you know, moving rivers, um, which do happen over time. And here's a cartoon showing how the fluvial hazard zone in red might be different from the inundation extent of a FEMA floodplain map. So in a kind of a narrow confined valley, um, the fluvial hazard zone could be wider than that floodplain because the floodplain is just going to show where water goes. The fluvial hazard zone is accounting for um, erosion within the active stream corridor as well as um, hill slope and bank erosion. Um, in a broad valley, it's possible that the inundation extent could be wider than the fluvial hazard zone, which accounts for kind of river migration within that corridor. Um, and then if the 100 year floodplain, for example, um, extends beyond that, it, it could be wider than the fluvial hazard zone. So I'm gonna turn it over to Molly to talk about how we map um, the fluvial hazard zone. But before that, I'll, I'll pause for any questions about um, kind of 
what the fluid hazard zone is. Um, and feel free to, to uh, ask a question as we as we proceed. All right. Um, so Molly, do you mind um, taking it from here? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so so there's a lot going on with fluvial hazard zone mapping. Um, but what you want to you want to kind of start out thinking about um, the overall geomorphic trajectories and story. Um, of the river system that you're dealing with. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, things you need to think about. One being energy flow and dissipation. So, um, you know, where, where uh, is flow coming from and, you know, how is it getting output downstream? Um, where is that flow going? Is it, is it hitting the floodplain surfaces? Um, is there riparian vegetation that is impeding some flow or slowing it down? Um, what is sediment doing, right? Um, so thinking about energy flow and dissipation um, is really important. Sediment continuity is also a very important concept. Um, so thinking kind of, kind of like we think about um, where the water is coming from and where it's going, we also want to think about kind of budgeting for sediment. So sediment inputs can come from uh, hill slopes, right? So thinking about debris flows um, and hill slope failures um, can introduce sediment into the river corridor, uh, but it can also come from upstream and just the, the river channel itself flowing down. Um, and another, another uh, source can be from the migration of meander, uh, meander bends, right? Lateral and down, um, down channel migration of a river system can, you know, um, change sediment, uh, sediment dynamics. Continue. So in terms of mapping the FHC, um, you have to understand the overall context of the river system that you are focusing on. So thinking about that, that's physiographic, um, you know, so like geologic mapping is really important. Thinking about the surficial geology maps, um, those can give you an indication of you know, where the river has been in the past, um, say you have some alluvium, right? Um, that probably indicates that the river was there at some point in the recent, um, recent past, right? Uh, thinking about hydrologic, um, you know, the hyd hydrologic connection is really important. So thinking about, um, are there these meander cutoffs that are still relatively connected? Um, you know, that's a great example. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, just the USGS gauge here, um, thinking about um, not just the you know kind of fluvial uh, hydrologic signatures, but also thinking about you know is this a snowmelt dominated dominated system? Is this a you know a rainfall dominated system? Um, what is impacting the discharge in the system is really important. Uh, and so we also have to think about um, kind of this large scale um, geomorphic trajectory, right? So thinking about um, like valley to reach scales. Um, so in geomorphology, we kind of think about, um, you know, this, this starting in the headwaters down into these valleys, right? So um, in, in more of these canyon based or headwater based systems, you have these very confined valleys um, you know, constricting the channel, constricting the floodplain. And that's generally where you have this more um, hill slope connected system. Um, you are getting more um, sediment, right? Um, it's a, a source zone of sediment. Um, and that sediment will eventually travel down um, into this more partially confined um, transfer slash response zone, right? So it's, it's beginning to meander. There's more lateral migration. Um, less so much that hill slope connection. Um, and then as we travel further down, you get into this unconfined valley, um, and that's more of a depositional zone, right, as opposed to more of a transport zone. And so you're depositing that sediment onto floodplains, um, and it's it can be pretty dynamic. And so these are all things you have to think about um, when actually, you know, delineating the fluvial hazard zone. Um, and so the first part of that, as Joel mentioned, is the active stream corridor. So this is a primary component of the fluvial hazard zone. 
Um, and the AFC essentially encompasses the land shaped by fluvial erosion and deposition under the prevailing flow and sediment regimes. Uh, so here we have an example from 2012 in the South St. Brain Creek. Um, this is a, you know, a delineation of that active stream corridor where we think the, um, the river could have an impact um, based on the current flow and sediment um, regimes. But then uh, in 2013, there was the, the large um, flooding event. Um, and you can see that the river um, has, has changed substantially um, and has taken up a lot of that space in that active stream corridor that was delineated, right? Uh, you can see in the southern part of that um, active stream corridor, the, the channel basically moved, it migrated, um, but it's also just a lot more dynamic now. There has been a lot of sedimentation and um, deposition of sediment, um, and this is all within that kind of active stream corridor. So this is a great example of, um, you know, the river not just being this, this small channel, but also a lot of the area around it um, as it moves and reacts to, um, you know, the geomorphic uh, stressors it has. So. so in order to map the active stream corridor, there's a few different ways you can do it. Um, but basically this schematic is a great way to kind of think about um, the best way to map your stream corridor. Um, and so first of all, you have to, you know, determine your study area, define your stream reaches. Um, obviously here it's the Grand Valley, right? Um, Colorado and Gunnison rivers. Um, but then you have to think about, um, thinking about, you know, whether it's an urban reach or a headwaters reach. So thinking about those headwaters reaches, those are, you know, um, pretty confined reaches, you know, transport. Um, so they might have a different you might have to think about things a little differently than you would say um, in an urban reach that is really constricted and regulated and controlled. Um, so once you decide if you know those are the case or not, um, then you have to determine the valley type, your confinement and valley slope. Um, and so a lot of rivers, you'll end up going to that step three and thinking about what kind of valley is this? Is the river really confined and constricted? Um, is it really connected with those hill slopes? Um, you know, is it a really steep system? So, um, you know, transporting that sediment um, and, and flow downstream. Um, these are all really important things to think about. Um, and ultimately, a lot of the, the streams um, that I've ended up mapping are these fluvial signature protocol streams. Um, and, you know, uh, we can go on to the next slide quick. Yep. Um, so basically fluvial signatures um, are, a, it's, it's a pretty great way to think about these streams. Um, there's um, a lot of dynamic um, processes going on, right? So thinking about, you know, what are the, the signatures that these rivers have left behind? Um, and here you can see there's this general stream channel that you can see in the blue. Um, this is a relative elevation model, by the way. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but there, you know, these, these um, different colors indicate different um, elevations relative to the stream channel. And so you can kind of glean that there are all these, you know, dynamic, you know, very complex um, elevations and topographies um, next to the channel. So you can see that this river has probably been migrating around and, and adjusting and changing, um, and that is reflected in this elevation. And so mapping your active stream corridor, um, you know, based on where the river has been um, is incredibly um, important in this case. Yeah, so the, the big thing here is identifying fluvial signatures. So fluvial signatures are these, these, these forms left behind um, from a, you know, uh, moving river system, right? Um, and so here's an example um, kind of by Palisade Clifton uh, of this, this old meander cutoff. Um, so on the, the imagery, you can see it, there's, you know, um, a bit of a, you can kind of see it. Um, there's like some more dense vegetation. Um, there's still some, some hydrologic, you know, there's water um, in the system a little bit. Um, and then on the left, you know, in this elevation model here, you can see that there is a slight, you know, remnant of that in the topography itself. Um, and so that's an indication, you know, these two together 
um, that the river, you know, once flowed there. And that might be something that is still relatively active today, um, especially if, you know, there's a large flood or something it could be reactivated a little bit. So that's something you want to consider. Um, yeah, there's, there's a ton of, you know, fluvial signatures thinking about, you know, meanders and, and oxbow lakes, um, just complex floodplain topography is a, you know, is, is something to think about, so. Yeah, and so I mentioned this uh, relative elevation model or an REM. And so, so basically this is an elevation model um, relative to the stream channel at its lowest point. Um, and this is really just really helpful in thinking about elevation, you know, um, not just in general, but relative to the stream and really helping you pick out those fluvial signatures. So on the left here, um, this is a great example. Um, I believe this is on the Yampa potentially. Um, but you can see the dark blue is where the, the current main stem channel is going and it's a nice meandering system. But then you can see um, in more of the center of the image there, there is a lot going on. Um, you know, you can see it, there are some meander cutoffs, um, maybe some oxbow lakes or some, um, you know, side channels. Um, so those are important to think about. Um, you know, and then there are some areas where it might be a little more difficult to parse out whether um, something is going on. So there's um, in the upper left hand corner, um, there's a larger greenish section and it doesn't seem like there's, yeah, there's not too much, um, you know, not much evidence of a fluvial signature there. So that might be somewhere where um, you might have to go and do some field work, um, field verification, um, as opposed to some of that other stuff where, you know, there's a side channel that's probably probably connected, it's probably in the active stream corridor. Yeah, and these are just another few examples. Um, I believe these are up by Gunnison. Um, and you can see there's just uh, different, different streams can have um, very different uh, relative elevation models and fluvial signatures that are present. So the top two, you know, are much more meandering the, well, the, the bottom one is a little bit too on the, the bottom right, that one's a little more complex uh, or maybe, you know, requires a little more field verification, might be a little more marshy, um, may not, might not have just that main channel um, so much. Um, but yeah, these are just some great examples of what they might look like. Yeah, and so I mentioned that, um, you might have to do some field verification. And that's an incredibly important part of fluvial hazard zone mapping. Um, basically, when you delineate your active stream corridor, you know, you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of areas that, you know, you're you're not really quite sure um, you know, what the situation is. Maybe maybe you're in an urban or agricultural area where the fluvial signatures are no longer visible on the elevation. Uh, model or um, the aerial imagery. And so, you know, you have to think about like, well, um, was the river potentially here and we're just not seeing it. Um, and so that's a great um, thing to look at in the field, um, you know, and, and just verify that your, your boundaries are, um, you know, makes sense. Um, so that's really important. Um, these are just two photos we took actually from our field work last week. Um, we drove down uh, the whole corridor uh, of Colorado, the Gunnison, and and took a look at uh, to, took a look at things and um, you know compared it to our ASCs. And yeah. So the other major kind of component of the fluvial hazard zone is the fluvial hazard buffer. And yeah, this basically accounts for that erosion prone land that extends beyond the ASC, the active stream corridor, um, especially when it, you know, could be eroded, um, you know, by, by the river, especially during floods. Um, so it's, you know, incredibly important um, and is applied outside of that active stream corridor um, boundary. Yeah, so here we have an example of an active stream corridor and fluvial hazard buffer. Um, in the yellow, that's the ASC. Um, so that's where the river is, you know, kind of actively under the current 
um, you know, sediment and flow regimes is kind of having an impact, right, um, where you might see these fluvial signatures. Um, but then this red um, area is that fluvial hazard buffer. Um, and so you can see here up in the, the north part, north um, top right section of the, the image here, yeah, you can see that it's, it's coming in contact with some of those um, like slopes and um, hill slopes there where you might have some of that erosion during um, a flood of some sort. And one of the key kind of reasons for having a flu hazard buffer is that fact that often areas that are thought to be high and dry outside of the floodplain um, still could be under the influence of these, you know, erosional and hill slope failure type hazards. Um, so here's an, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll look. Turn it back over to yeah, so just an example of where this might exist. Um, we don't have the ASC finalized, obviously, yet or drafted um, for this area. But um, should the ASC, if this is considered kind of like a high terrace that's outside of the floodplain on the right bank, um, the flu hazard buffer would account for the fact that you know the river can still migrate into higher banks and terraces. Um, so, just an example of where this happened, the city had to. Um, come in and, and rectify this area where we had bank erosion. And I believe there's some utilities in here to, um, to protect. But just an example where we um, will be mapping other areas that, that could be potentially under the influence of this type of erosion. Um, so I'll talk about um, what we're doing in the Grand Valley here. Um, this is the project. And there's a project scope, geographic scope here. So we're starting um, above um can't remember what they call this beaver tail or something like that area um down through island acres the back canyon past cameo and then through palisade grand junction and fruta all the way out to the loma boat ramp and just beyond that um just to kind of capture some of the um active stream corridor that's that's in that area and then we're starting just upstream of white water and making our way through um, lower Canyon, and then down to the confluence on the Gunnison. Our tasks, our scope, um, are to first conduct background research, um, that geomorphic context that we talked about earlier, hydrologic context, um, collect data in the field, as well as some um, remotely conduct that field reconnaissance um, that we've done the, the first iteration of. And then all that goes into informing uh, our delineation of those components. Um, once we have that um, draft delineation, I'll talk about the kind of stakeholder communication in a minute here. We'll get feedback. Um, it'll also do a, a third party um, review of that. And we'll also have a technical report to support the, the map itself. Um, part of that report will include identification of management options for um, how, you know, how does this polluted hazard zone map meet the road, so to speak? How can it be applied for um, infrastructure management, um, floodplain management, and the like? Um, so, I'll be interested in your your feedback about kind of what are your areas of concern, areas of interest in in applying this. And then our last task is what we're doing right now: communicating to our stakeholders, coordinating with you all, and making sure we get your feedback and input along the way. Here's our schedule. We've begun the background data collection and mapping this summer and um, early fall. Um, we'll be reaching back out to you all. It'll probably be before November at this point to um, get input on draft map products. Also be working on that mitigation application planning this fall. Um, we'll have our QA, QC expert um, external technical review of these components. Um, and then this winter, it could be, um, we have it right now in January, but hopefully we can do that a little bit earlier. Um, we'll have our final workshop, which will be the presentation of the results. So um, workshop number two, actually, we'll, we'll talk about those right now. Um, we've got our project kickoff meeting. Um, we're presenting kind of what the map is, the, the process is. We want to, at the end of this, discuss um, goals and objectives that you all might have, um, areas of concern, ideas for opportunities for this project as it pertains to your areas of interest. 
our second meeting, we'll be presenting the draft map and um, application mitigation plan. That will happen later this fall. And then we'll have a final meeting, which will be kind of rolling everything out, um, presenting the results and um, talking about next steps. All right, so any questions or comments up to this point? Great, um, and then was that Pete Furman that just called in? Yeah, I'm just listening right now. I'm driving Great. back from my meeting. All right, thanks for calling in, Pete, appreciate it. Um, and I'll make sure we, we follow up a little bit more to, um, uh, Talk, talk with you. So um, just a little bit of background, more background on the Grand Valley. Um, I've got some images of the historic river footprints. I actually had a student do this mapping for me um, back in 2020. Um, and it's gonna be helpful and informative for this project too, of how the river's kind of moved over time. Um, we have a hill slope image and then some of the footprints from 1937 up to 86. And then you can see kind of the margins of the river that are here. I think the LIDAR is from 2016 or 2015. Um, so the river is migrating certain areas. Um, it's, it's moving, adjusting its margins. Um, obviously things are changing as we develop and, and put up levees and gravel ponds and, and that sort of thing. Um, but historically the river has been a, a migrating system. So here's uh, moving downstream. This was um, upstream in the Clifton area. And uh, you can see Corn Lake uh, right here. Then we have moving downstream through town, uh, Las Colonias and Dos Rios developments. The river has kind of moved back and forth. Its main channels now on the south side here and the Dos Rios area. Um, we're just talking with the developers about how this side channel that used to be the main channel, but now it's the side channel is, is kind of functioning. Um, and then kind of a lot of complexity and dynamism, islands forming, disappearing, migration um, out and coming back. Sometimes the river's moving, sometimes we're pushing the river. Here's that area up to Redlands Parkway. Um, we've got some really wild stuff happening right here in the um, connected lakes area as uh, this kind of hard point where we have a power line is um, creating kind of a wild scour hole area and the river's bifurcating here. Um, but that's a kind of relatively recent phenomenon and historically the river was farther to the north here. Moving downstream, we've got the corridor that comes into the interstate, comes into contact with the interstate. Um, and we've got some migration that's kind of been moving in this direction into this kind of farmland gravel pond area. Also, we have a lot of the river that's in contact with uh, the Minko Shale Bluffs to the south. Um, that's going to be an area where we'll have that fluvial hazard buffer. And in some areas, um, if there's, I don't know if there's uh, specific geotechnical studies that kind of talk about um, hill slope fa failure in these areas, but we'll, we'll be kind of reviewing those if they exist to think about how far back these hill slopes could, could erode as the river's slowly picking away at them. Um, so that's just a little kind of preview of the history of channel migration in the valley. Um, the river is dynamic. Um, it's an ongoing you know, process as well as a management issue um, that we'll be you know, getting your feedback on and, and trying to address um, in, as we map this and, and develop mitigation plans. Um, but I guess the last point I'll make before I turn it back over to Molly is that um, the kind of main goal of mapping the flu hazard zone is to just identify kind of where the river wants to be, where it has moved in the past, where it could be in the future. Um, from there, you know, our, our partners, you all have to decide, you know, what do we want to do about it? Where are we going to be kind of armoring up and kind of continuing to um, actively um, kind of be pushing back on bank erosion and, and channel migration, where do we have opportunities to allow for this to occur? And, um, and we'll talk about some, some of the applications of it at the end here. 
Yeah, so some of the progress we've made on fluvial hazard zone mapping so far um, is we've basically delineated um, the geomorphic reaches um, and created the relative elevation model for both the Colorado and Gunnison. And just to mention like uh, geomorphic reaches are basically just ways to think about the river in these chunks where, you know, um, in those reaches, the geomorphology is kind of similar. There are similar processes going on. So maybe, you know, it's, it's really connected to the hill slope there. So you're getting a lot of um, potential for hill slope erosion or something like that. Um, it's just important to kind of think about the river um, in these reaches sometimes to help the overall understanding of what's going on. Um, but so down here we have the Colorado River um, and its relative elevation model. Um, and we so far have come up with 10 reaches um, for the Colorado. And so zooming in, this is, um, you know, down by the confluence with the Gunnison. Um, this is just an example of our drafted active stream corridor that we've um, created. And so you can see um, at the start of the image on the northwest part of the, the image there, there's the orange dot, that's the reach start. And then um, there's one at the, the reach break at the confluence because, you know, confluences with river, other rivers can, you know, really impact flow and changes in sediment. Um, and then there is a, a second reach break um, at the very bottom, um, bottom right there. Um, and you can see that the ASC in some places is pretty, um, relatively small and is kind of following along with, um, you know, some of the, the greener, um, you know, bluer sections of that REM. Um, and you can see some of those fluvial signatures popping out, especially by the, the confluence of the Gunnison. Um, there's some interesting stuff going on down there. Um, but then you can also see in some areas that uh, there are these large blue squares and those are, you know, the gravel ponds, gravel pits. Uh, and those are, you know, relatively close to the stream and are generally um, included in that active stream corridor because they can, uh, you know, be influenced and influence things during during floods and kind of become part of the, the stream corridor um, and are just very influential. So that's, that's where you have some of these wider sections of this active stream corridor. And one thing I'll note is that um, according to the Colorado protocol for delineating these things, there's a few areas where we'll say, you know, this human infrastructure basically curtails the active stream corridor. And in, that, in those cases, it's major highways as well as FEMA certified levees. And other cases where we just have ad hoc levees, we typically don't consider those to kind of curtail the active stream corridor. Yeah, and then for the Gunnison, um, this one is a little, uh, little less complex. Uh, you know, there's um, three reaches um, and fewer, you know, a little less um, influence on the river corridor. So there's not as many, um, you know, it's a little easier to verify the Gunnison. Uh, but here are two of the reaches. Um, so you can see on the left, um, the ASC is relatively straightforward, right? It's a relatively confined system. There's not that much going on. It's it's traveling through, it's really connected to its hill slopes. Um, there's a few kind of um, bars that are included, right? Um, but relatively straightforward. And then on the right, you have white water um, where the stream opens up into this big meander bend with some gravel ponds. Um, you've got the railroad going through there and um, up on the north section of that, that northern gravel pond, um, we had to do some field verification there, for example, of, you know, whether we, we think that the, the river is actually going to, um, you know, actively impede that area at any point was a question of ours. So that's just a, a great example of like something that we adjusted after our field work. Um, but generally, yeah, you can see that there's some differences in the ASC between the left where it's, you know, relatively connected to its hill slopes and kind of confined as opposed to this, you know, nice, this bigger meander and a wider ASC and active stream quarter. Thank you, Molly. Um, so. I'll, I want to save some time for discussion. We're kind of getting close to our hour here. So I want to um, just summarize that the fluvial geomorphic uh, map is both something to delineate hazards as well as opportunities. Um, this is something that Chris Stern likes to, to um, uh, emphasize is 
can think of it as opportunities as well as hazards. So um, we're identifying risks of erosion and deposition hazard within the river corridor, but um, part of this can inform prioritization for areas for development, conservation, and restoration. Um, and then also thinking about siting and planning river compatible infrastructure as we, um, as our bridges and roads and other infrastructure um, are developed and, and um, um, kind of renovated over time, we can kind of think about how th this, this type of mapping can inform how we can go about doing that in a way that's potentially more compatible with the river in these processes. Um, so I'm gonna, um, these are kind of the points, you know, I'm gonna kind of blow through these really quickly just because I wanna get your all's feedback, but we're interested in reducing hazard, we're interested in creating uh, more resilient infrastructure, especially after um, impacts from floods. We can incorporate this into um, local planning. The flu hazard zone map is not a regulatory document by any stretch of the imagination. It's something that each municipality and locality can adopt in whatever way that makes sense for them. Um, it might be some uh, informational tool. It might be something that is more explicitly incorporated into floodplain management and permitting. Um, so ultimately we hope to have more informed floodplain management where um, we can site infrastructure in ways that are gonna be more um, compatible and resilient to river processes. Um, and we can also use it to inform conservation, restoration goals. So fluvial you know, dynamic areas um, are often complex and, and important habitat, right? So as the river's migrating, it's creating side channels, bars, pools, all these things are important for aquatic habitat and riparian habitat. Finally, it's a tool for communication. The, um, the fluvial hazards exist. The dynamic river has already been you know, doing this for, for centuries and, and millennia. Um, so mapping these do not create new hazards. We don't want to alarm anyone. I know, um, you know, when you go through the FEMA mapping process it can be potentially contentious as floodplains change. Um, but what we're trying to do here is provide additional hazard information for informed decision-making. So there's a lot of resources available on the website. Please check it out. Um, we've got some facts, um, a lot of documents that I've referenced in previous emails. Um, so you can kind of use those as uh, if you need to pass this information around to your colleagues and folks um, you're working with at your various agencies. The protocol is also there if you're interested in taking a look at it. Um, we've got an ArcGIS tool to, that develops the relative elevation model. Um, and I will kind of stop there and thank you for your attention um, and want to discuss with you all um, these following things. So um, the first question um, I'm going to put to you and we can kind of open it up from here is um, love to have the questions you have regarding mapping in general, how it applies to the valley. I'm interested in hearing about the areas of concern you have as it relates to geomorphic hazards. Um, and I'll follow up with you all to ask for photos, um, you know, annotated maps with comments on, you know, this is, there's some areas of concern I have or areas of interest. For example, I know Pete Berman is interested in knowing um, what this map might look like in areas where um, we have CPW property and, you know, new projects, trails, and that sort of thing. Um, so as you think about your infrastructure, your planning, and developments, let's let's kind of talk about um, and kind of zero in on some areas of concern and we can we can focus on those as we carry out this project. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to see get your comments about how how you see this playing out in your community and your um, area of concern, your jurisdiction, uh, what opportunities do you see, what challenges do you see? So I'll stop there and, and kind of open it up. Right. Um, so maybe I'll just start with um, um, Carrie, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot. Um, do you have any thoughts, or reflections from the Mesa County perspective about this about this project? I think it's I think it is great because obviously we have such a changing dynamic river. Um, I think it will be really good to be able to communicate this to to our um, 
customers because they are they are going to be interested in this information and how it's going to affect them. Great. And, and when you refer to customers, are you talking about kind of developers or individuals coming in for permits? Um, I'm just talking about any residential uh, property owner or property owner in general. Yeah. Great. Well, I, I definitely want to, you know, as we kind of roll this out, um, get your thoughts about how to best communicate it. You know, we've got certainly maps and kind of definitions and stuff like that, but I want to make sure we provide you with the visuals and tools and information that can best kind of convey what this what this is. Um, let's see here. Um, how about uh, Sam, do you have any thoughts from the Fruita perspective? Uh, no, there may be, I'm trying to think of areas. I think one of the areas that may or may not be of concern really isn't in Fruita, but our Cocapelli Trail runs along that alignment. Um, is this something that you anticipate that would show up on Mesa County's GIS just as a, another layer? And that might be a question for Mesa County. Yeah, yeah. I think we'd have to look at how we, um, how we plan for development and or how we allow for homes to be built in some of these areas based on that based on a new line so to speak that would be a boundary that we would want to preserve yeah and um as far as like you know posting this this information um you know it's it's going to be uh, a document that's you know funded by state money right so it's it's not anything that's going to be held um privately by rivers edge west or uh so it's but at the same time we want to make sure we're kind of rolling this out in a way that's not going to be shocking um to our um you know other folks out there that are interested in this the community as well as our you know um, political leaders um so is it something that someone can just go on Mesa County and, and pull up perhaps, uh, but I think that ultimately we wanna make sure that's a decision that works with um, within the um, policy of the county itself, as well as the decision makers. And I think a good point to that too, is then how is that gonna relate regulatory wise? I mean, is this just gonna be a guidance document and then people are aware of the potential hazard? Is that how you see it? You know, it, it, at, at, a, at a minimum, it's certainly, you know, just informational. Um, you know, we've got this this map, we've got these you know, delineations that kind of inform where the river is moving. Um, from the river corridor initiative perspective, I think we're interested in seeing where we want to focus um, resources towards various uses, right? Where we want to encourage and support river corridor developments, you know, commercial, residential, and where we want to um, encourage and support conservation and restoration for uh, fish and birds, et cetera, that, that use the river corridor. Um, from the permitting perspective, I mean, that's that's something that, you know, kind of once we have this, it's a discussion within Mesa County of what you want to do with it. We've got um, a, model ordinance that was developed that has language for how it could be if there's interest um, at the staff and, and commissioner level to incorporate this in um, floodplain management ordinance or land use management ordinance. Um, so that's an option, um, but at this point it's a discussion that I'm happy to kind of help facilitate, but also, um, you know, that's a discussion for Mesa County to, to have. And I think that would be really good um, for you maybe to come in and mm -hmm. facilitate the discussion and just bring this information um, up to several folks that I feel like need to be aware that this is going to happen and then what at what direction they want to take it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I can I can circle back with you, Carrie, about kind of at what stage it would make sense to do that perhaps one or a little further along and have some drafts to, to look at. Uh, 
Um, how about the Fish and Wildlife Service? Do you guys have any questions, thoughts? Um, Creed, do you want to talk or do you want me to? Go ahead, Kathy, and then I'll follow up. Well, I'm going to tell him what you told me in our little side conversation and that um, it'll be interesting to see how this exercise follows the 100 year floodplain of the river as that could be beneficial to us in, um, in a shape file form to um, use as a guide for fish critical habitat and um, also cuckoos. So um, yeah, I, I think it'll be a very useful tool for us, um, especially since as you said, it's going to be available, um, hopefully in a GIS layer as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just to add on to that, it's, it'll be helpful to identify the river corridor, including the floodplains. Uh, we've, we don't have a perfect shape file for critical habitat for the endangered fish along the Colorado River. The one we have on our website is just the active channel. It doesn't include the floodplain. And so, this product might better approximate critical habitat than what we have on our own website. And so that would be really interesting to us. Sure, great. And then Pete, um, I know you're kind of been moving around here, but um, any kind of initial thoughts on this and how it applies to CPW and the state park system? Uh, Joe, I, I apologize. Um, no, no worries at all. Not, not being able to see the maps, but I guess in terms of just topically, where it's helpful is just understanding maybe potential risks to some of the facilities because nearly everything that I manage is right next to the river. Uh, right. and, and as you kind of alluded to, as we uh, prepare for uh, trail expansion along the river corridor, it'll be good to know how far uh, we should be offset to try to uh, limit the likelihood that we're gonna suffer damage to the trail um, in the future. Uh, so just understanding that, I mean, two specific areas or three actually, I know corn, the dike at corn has been built up as well as Fruta, as well as Island Acres. Um, and then since I've been here, there was real risk that the dike at Island Acres would rupture. So just making sure that I'm sorry, the, the dike at Fruta would rupture. Uh, so just having an understanding of um, what future risk we may have in that area uh, would be helpful. Okay. Great, well, um, yeah, Trent, did you um, wanna add anything? Yeah, I just, you know, how it interrelates with, you know, land use, you know, and some of the planning um, there. I mean, obviously, that's why we try to do as much mapping as we can. And this goes another level beyond, you know, the floodplain um, mapping that we've done. And, and so I did take a screenshot of the section down here in between. Uh, it looks to be maybe 30 road all the way back to 24 road um, that you had. I think you had slide six or something like that yeah. on that draft ASC boundary. And and um, anyway, yeah, how that interrelates to um, future development and our zoning and, and so forth down there. Because, and yeah, that, that pink line east of 27 and a half road goes quite a way. It goes all the way up to C and a half. So, um, you know, how that interrelates to what we have planned, you know, down there, even though it's way far north, that the line is definitely far, far north of where the current floodplain mm -hmm. uh, is. But, um, Anyway, so how all that interrelates, but it, as you said, you know, at the very minimum, at least we'll have more information out there. People will be more informed about, you know, the risks associated with their property, even though it may not be in a flood plain. Um, um, it definitely has, you know, um, fluvial risk, if you will, um, you know, the, the chance of that, that river moving um, around in that zone. So anyway, yeah, more to come, but um, yeah. Just look forward to be able to look at some of this at yeah. a little, um, little smaller scale um, here at some point. Absolutely, and yeah, um, probably in a, probably a, I don't know, I don't want to put a timeline on it, but within two months we'll be promulgating draft maps, and so that'll be the opportunity to kind of really look at it and 
um, scratch your head and ask questions and make notes and, and we can kind of get into the nitty gritty and discuss it there. Um, I will say that, you know, with all the developments, all the um, gravel ponds and dikes, there's a lot of areas where um, we don't have, a, you know, there's a, we, we have to make judgment calls about where to draw the line. And um, we document those decisions as we go. And we'll, we want to be very transparent about that mapping process. And so that's going to be an opportunity where we can, um, you know, have that discussion a little bit more about specific areas. Great. Um, well, we're a little bit beyond three. Um, I'm happy to hang on if anyone else wants to chat or ask questions. Um, I'll follow up with an email to request some specific information from you all about particular areas of concern or interest um, where you have maybe new projects, you know, that are in the pipeline. And that way we can make sure we um, pay attention to those areas as we do this, this mapping and drafting exercise. Hey, Joel, um, I don't know if you saw in the chat, but Carrie Gudorf oh. um, wanted to make the group aware that the, the floodplain um, floodplain maps are being updated. CWCB is working on that for the entire Colorado River Basin coming down through Mesa County, especially. And, and um, so we're excited about what um, uh, how our maps might be changing here in the next 18 months or so. So is that the timeline, Carrie, of when you expect it to be finalized or? I think they're supposed to get adopted by 2024. Right now we have preliminary data on um, most everything that I've seen except for Colorado River is something I should be seeing tomorrow. Okay. A little glimpse of. But they will be, it will be based on a, I, I believe a six inch rise or half foot rise instead of a one foot rise of the floodway definition. So instead of being able to push that floodplain in to where that floodplain goes up a foot, that's generally how they've defined, you know, their their floodways. Um, now it'll be limited more to just the the half a foot rise, okay. instead, so you won't be able to push that in mm. for. So the floodway will be expanded. It will. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Um, well, I appreciate everyone's time and attention. Um, yeah, I look forward to working with you all, and I'll make sure I follow up individually. Um, to get some more information and comments. So stay tuned and I uh, really appreciate your support initially for this project when we went after the grants and look forward to continuing working with you. Thanks. Great. All oh. right, thanks everybody. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, thanks everyone. Yeah, Joel and Molly, thank you very much. And then Molly, let's um, chat and have everyone signed up.